Tonight, God is, is informing us, encouraging us to call unto him, call to him, to call after him. Jeremiah writes this letter from a court prison. Jeremiah writes this letter because he is locked up or he is shut up. He writes this letter because his, his speaking and his preaching has gotten him in trouble. Okay. You see, you can get in trouble by doing the right thing as well as you can get in trouble by doing the wrong thing. Amen. 
Jeremiah is in trouble because he prophesies to the king. Jeremiah is in trouble. When you look at chapters 31 through 33, you find out Jeremiah is dealing with King Zedekiah. And as he deals with King Zedekiah, he reminds King Zedekiah of Judah. He says to him that your nation is in trouble. Okay. He says to him that, that, that not only is the nation in trouble, but the people of the nation are in trouble. Jeremiah says to the king, he says, King, let me just share with you, let me tell you uh, what you need to know, what you need to understand is the Babylonians are coming. God is going to allow the Babylonians to take over this nation. He says, King Zedekiah, I want you to know that when, when King Nebuchadnezzar comes, the king of the Babylonians, they're going to take over the nation. Matter of fact, they will subdue you. You will become servants to them. Right. And he says, they will have the victory over you. Mm -hmm. Now that was enough right there. That was enough right there for him to be locked up in prison. Right. So he throws him in prison. And now he's writing this letter from prison. He says that I need to let you know that even though things are going wrong in your life, God is still listening. God is still wanting you to call unto him. Let's go back to uh, Jeremiah 32 as we lead up to Jeremiah 33. Jeremiah 32 beginning at verses 26 to, uh, to the end, toward the end of that chapter you see what's going on with the return of the people. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. God makes sure that Jeremiah and us, and we rather, know that God is the one who created everything. That's right. He created everybody. He is the God of all flesh. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 32, verses 26 and going forth, he said, Behold, I am the Lord of all flesh. And he asked the question, Is anything too hard for me? We're familiar with that question. God always asks the question, is anything too hard for me? And we all ask each other the question, is anything too hard for God? Is there anything too hard for God? God gives the assurance to the people that they will return. But he has a lecture for them first. Behold, I am the Lord God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Therefore, thus said the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hands of the Chaldeans, into the hands, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. God has already concluded who the winner is going to be. God has already said that the Chaldeans, the king of Babylon, the Babylonians are going to take over the city. He says, he says, Behold, I'm the God of all flesh. I'm the God of everybody, everything. He asked the question, Is anything too hard for me? He says, I will give this city into the hands of the Chaldeans, into the hand of, of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and he's going to overtake the city. God has a way of dealing with us because of our mess. He goes on to talk about the fact that he is going to deal with us. He says, in the Chaldeans who fight 
the Chaldeans who, sh who fight against this city shall come and set fire to the city and burn it. With the houses on whose roofs they have offered incense to Baal. So God is allowing them to be attacked and allowing the enemy to be victorious over them. First of all, because they worship the, the idol god Baal. What is your God? Who is your God? Is your interest, your personal interest, becoming your God? Is your personal wants becoming your God? It says it's he is allowing this to fall on the roofs, this fire to burn the city because the people have offered incense to Baal and poured out the drinks, the drink offerings to other gods. The God we serve is I, it is a, he is a jealous God. He says we ought not to have any God before him. He is a jealous God. He already, he already prefaces by saying to us, he says to us, I am the God of all flesh. I'm the God of everything and everybody. And there is nothing, what he's really saying when he asks a rhetorical question, there is nothing too hard for me. I am God. I am the Lord. I created everything, I made everything, and now because I am sovereign, I do what I want to do, I do it when I want to do it, I do to whoever I want to do it, whenever I want to do it, any way I want to do it, I'm God, and since I'm God, and since you all have been disobedient, and since you've been worshiping either gods, your enemies going to have your way, their way with you. He says, you all have offered incense to the idol god Baal. You all have poured out drink offerings to other gods, these fake gods, these gods that are made of wood, these gods that are made of metal, these gods who have feet and cannot walk, these gods who have hands and cannot touch, these gods who have no heart of compassion, he said, you have been dealing with them and worshiping them to the point now you have provoked me to anger. Look what he says in verse number 29. He says, you people have provoked me to anger. You people have gotten to the point where I am just angry. And I didn't just wake up angry. Y'all provoked me to anger. You all got me all stirred up to anger. It's a dangerous thing to fall into the hands of the angry God. Amen. I'm telling you, it's a dangerous thing when you fall into the hands of the angry God. Verse number 30, because the children of Israel and the children of Judah have done only evil before me from their youth up to now. He said, y'all didn't just stop, start being evil. This is not something you started against, did it? You've been evil from your childhood. It says from your youth. And they, they have only been evil. Have done only evil before me. And they did it in the sight of God. Right while God was standing there. Right while God is looking there. Because you know we have an all-knowing, all-seeing God, right? And they were no, they were not ashamed of it. They worship idol gods right in God's presence. Mama. He said, Y'all have provoked me. Y'all got me all stirred up now because of the children of Israel, because of the children of Judah. You all have done this evil even from your youth. 
What are some of the things we've done that now that we are more mature, what are some of the things we did in our childhood that we know are wrong now? What are some of the things that we know are wrong now? That we did in our childhood that we try to teach other children not to do. Give me one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, fifteen, eighteen. Stealing. Mm -hmm. So young people figure that if they take a little this or a little that, they didn't think anything was wrong with it. Stealing. Get your hands out that cookie jar. Well, you stick your hand in the cookie jar. Huh? Kool-Aid. You said she stole Kool-Aid. Stole some Kool-Aid. <laughs> Did you repent of stealing that Kool-Aid? Oh, Kool-Aid and sugar taking to school? That's the worst thing that people of our age could do. <laughs> What's well, another thing that we did as children that we know now we should have never done and we know that it's wrong? Somebody say lying. Lying. There are some children just going to tell a lie if you ask them anything. Did you eat this morning? Well, uh, let it, they're trying to get that lie together. Would you like something to eat? Well, uh, they're trying to get their life. Some children will just lie just to be lying. Anything else? Bad language. Bad language? Is that called per, uh, uh, profane language? Is that, is that called cussing? So children cuss. Not the children that can do the church, though. Our children don't cuss. I, I just know our children don't cuss. So the Bible says that they did evil, even as young children. What are some other things young children do that we know not to do, but they don't know what to do? Bullying. 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 Big bad person on the playground, big bad person in school. And now we got grown folk bullying. We got people that run for the highest office in the land that's bullied. Bullied, pushing people around, threatening people, telling them what they ought to do. Bullying. Anything else that children do that we know not to do? Disrespecting their elders. Disrespecting their elders. God said, You've done this from your youth, you've done this from your childhood, and you're still doing this craziness. You do know there are some there are some seniors and some young adults that still are doing what they did in their childhood, right? Yeah. And that is that is that is the theme of this entire chapter and the next chapter. The fact that they did stuff before the Lord in the presence of God, because you can't hide anything from God. They did stuff in the presence of God right before his eyes that they did even from childhood. Anything else? What about zodiac sign? Anything wrong with zodiac sign? Uh, yeah. They think they, they, they make me feel good though. They they zodiac sign make me feel good. Have you ever read a zodiac sign that was bad? What about horoscopes? See the difference between modern day prophets and biblical day prophets is that the biblical day prophet did just prophesy all good. The modern day prophets, if you can get in the Coliseum, they're going to prophesy something good to you. Yes? They're going to tell you whatever you want to hear, they're going to tell you whatever you've been going through, but then the problem is you got to tell them everything you've been going through for them to tell you what's going to happen. Horoscopes. Ouija boys. How many of you know some people used to play with Ouija boys? These things are evil. When you sit in the dark and put your hand on a board and, and it guides you all around and, and then when you finally turn the lights on, you see your future. Anytime, anything predicts your future other than God, it is not of God. What about Halloween? How many of y'all ever went trick-or-treating? Everybody went. Is trick-or-treating the thing to do? 
get a lot of care and get a lot of stomach aches. It's not of God. Goblin said, Ouija board said, Ghost. I oftentimes tell people where I grew up, where I grew up, uh, I was scared enough times to wait for Halloween to be scared. Some of us just don't need to be scared of anything. So we have to understand that there are things that we have done in our past that we ought not do in our present. God said these people in Ju Judah and these people in Israel have been sinful, have been evil, even back to the days of their youth. Talking back to grown folk. Sassin, that, that was the word when I was growing up. How many of you know what sassin, grown folk mean? Y'all know what sassin is? Yes. Sassin, everybody in the room? I guess everybody in the room over 45 tonight. <laughs> so, sassin, grown people, rolling your eyes, breathing under your breath. When I was a, a teenager, you couldn't even Breathe under your breath. It was disrespect. You couldn't say, hmm. Now children got an all-out lecture for you. <laughs> Tell grown folks, now look, you sit out and you don't say anything. And see, it ought to be a point in your life when you realize that respect for your elders must become a problem. It doesn't matter how old your parents get or how old the people next door get. Regardless, we ought to respect them. And we ought to respect each other. And certainly, we ought to respect ourselves. What do I mean when I say respect yourself? What does that mean? Respect. Respect yourself. What does that mean? We know what it means to respect other people, right? But what does it mean to respect yourself? Respect. How do you tell when a boy or a girl respecting themselves? We teach them to respect themselves, right? We teach them to respect others. But what does it mean to respect yourself? Okay, tell me what it means to disrespect yourself. To live a Christ-like life. To live a Christ-like life you is respecting yourself. Don't do crazy stuff. Carry yourself in a godly way, not doing crazy stuff. So it's disrespectful to yourself when you don't do godly things. Okay, now tell me some other things that's, that's not based on godliness when you disrespect yourself or you do respect yourself. Does our, our wardrobe have anything to do with respecting ourselves? We have to teach little girls, we have to teach them early on that to keep it covered. Respect yourself. Watch it. I mean, the guy that made tights, he's making billions and billions and billions. Y'all know what type? Leggings. And I think he should have put on the label, these are not to be worn outside the house. These are undergarments. Respect yourself. Present yourself in a godly way, in an attractive way. And then what, what people have come to the conclusion is when the label said one side fits all the spring, they say one side fits all. Respect yourself. Carry yourself in a way that you can gain respect from others. He says if you all been carrying out like this, is even away from your youth. Then he says, For the children of Israel have provoked me only to anger with the work of their hands. They have provoked me to anger with the work of their hands. The things that they did, the things that they worship, the attitudes they've had, they have provoked God to anger. You know, God is so long-suffering. Can you testify that God is long-suffering? Mm -hmm. God just keeps on putting up with us. Keeps on putting up with us. He just keeps on putting up with us. With the work of their hands, 
said the Lord, they have provoked me to anger. For this city has been to me a provocation, a provocation of anger in my fury from the day that they built it, even to this day. First of all, he says, you've been evil from your youth unto now. And then he says, not only have you been evil from your youth unto now, you worship idol gods. And then comes now, he says, this city is evil. In this city has been a pain in my side. It has brought about fury. He has made God anger, angry from the day of his death. Right. Wow. God is long suffering. God keeps putting up with us. So I will remove it from before my face. God says, I'm going to wipe it off the earth. I will remove it from my face because of all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger. They, their kings, their princes, and here's a long list of those in charge. He didn't leave it. Now he says, not only have you provoked me to anger from your youth, not only have you worshipped idol gods, not only have you even poured out offerings to idol gods, not only did you uh, build a city that's been disrespectful and evil to me from the day they built it, now I'm going to tell you this. The fact of the matter is, I'm going to remove you. I'm going to take you out. Heard a person say the other day, God can bless you in the morning before noonday, he can wipe you out. God can bless you early in the morning, and before nine o'clock, you can be wiped out. See, people don't fear God anymore. They don't, they don't have the fear of God. They, they, they have disrespect for God, they have disrespect for the church, they have disrespect for the man of God. They have disrespect for the people of God. People don't respect God as they used to. Amen. Who are we leading the church to? How, are, how is the church going to continue to roll on as a spiritual organism if we are growing up a nation of people that don't respect God? So move with me very quickly in uh, Jeremiah chapter 33. The setting is set. We know that we're dealing with a bunch of evil people, and these are people that God has brought out of the wilderness, have brought out of Egypt, have relieved them, have kept them even when the death angel rolled by. He says, moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the second time. Jeremiah has already said to the king, your people have messed up, you messed up, this whole nation has messed up. So the word comes a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the prison, while he was still locked down. I would, I would stand to reason that if I'm in prison, I'm not going to be too worried about writing somebody else about it. Not a letter about themselves. If I write a letter, it's going to be a letter to the judge, a letter to the family members. But Jeremiah writes a letter while he's in prison to try to get people's souls right, to get people to understand where God stands. So he writes this letter. He tells them, the word of the Lord came to the came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the prison, saying, these are the things that the Lord says. Thus says the Lord, and I'm talking about this God who made it. He says, thus says the Lord, the Lord who formed it. I'm talking about this Lord 
the Lord who established it. You notice the, the word Lord is in all caps. It, it is the self-existing God. It is the, the God who is the creator. See, he says, the Lord who formed it, the Lord, the Lord who made it, the Lord who established it. It gives us the idea that God is not only the architect, but he's the contractor also. God thought this place into being. God thought us into being. Amen. God spoke in light came. It's God. It is. It is God. It, it, Jeremiah says, is that God? The God who made it? The God who formed it? The God who established it? The Lord is his name. So he's telling us, before he tells us to pray, before he tells us to call upon him, he says the Lord is his name. He is the God that made us. He's the God who formed us. He's the God who established it. Even the situations that we're in, it did not sneak up on God. Amen. Even the circumstances we're going through, God is aware of it. In some of the situations we in, we make. Other situations we in, our bad choices made them. But then there are some situations we in that God made it. God intentionally made it happen. Amen. Because he has become an angry God. What are, what are some of the things that can make God angry? What are some of the things that can get on God's nerves? And we have to relate to him. You know, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. But when we talk about anger, we see God as a, a spirit who have characteristics of a person. He, he gets angry. So what are some of the things that make him angry? What are some of the things that get on God's nerves? Yes, sir. Disobedience to his word. Disobedience to his word. Number one, at the top. Disobedience. What is disobedience to his word? Everything that God says do, we ought to do. If we choose not to do it, then we disobey God. And that disobedience is sin. There are three things that the devil tempts us with. Three ways. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life. God gets angry when we don't do it God's way. And check this out. When we do it God's way, God blesses. When we don't do it God's way, God is not obligated to bless it. Even sometimes when we don't do it God's way, God still blesses us. God gives us a chance to repent. God gives us another opportunity to get it right. And finally, verse 3, Jeremiah says, Jeremiah 33 and 3. He said, this is the Lord. The Lord who made us. The Lord who established us. The Lord who formed us. The Lord is his name. And verse 3 says, God is saying to us, call to me. He says, call to me. He says, pray. He says, have a dialogue with me. God is saying to us, he wants us to call on him. He wants us to pray to him. Now don't just call on him when you need something or when things are bad, because the fact of the matter is, God doesn't want you to just call on him when you need something, because when you call on him on a regular basis and it becomes a custom of you calling on him, it strengthens the fellowship. It strengthens the fellowship with God. And then, when you strengthen the fellowship, you'll be walking and there's danger that you don't see. God will move you all around. Yes, fella, fella tells a story about his GPS and he was taking his dad to the doctor. And as he was driving his dad to the doctor, the GPS said exit. And the dad said, what are you doing? You're going the wrong way. He said, dad, I'm just following the GPS. 
And he says, he says, when he exited, it looked like he had taken the wrong turn. When he exited, the daddy said, I don't want to be late for my appointment. And when, once they exit and they rode along beside the highway, they realized that traffic was bad though. And the GPS was just leading them around the traffic. He realized, he realized that if he had stayed on the highway, he would have been late. But because the GPS told him to exit, and he exited, because he exited, he was there before time. That's how God is doing us. God is leading us. God is guiding us. And if we stay in tune with God, if we obey God, the, the GPS himself, God is the global positioning system. He knows how to position us for blessings. But in order for him to do it, we got to call to him. We got to pray to him. We got to ask God to intervene. He says, if you call on me, I will answer you. He said, call on him, pray to him, address him, dialogue with him, and he'll answer you. And when he answers you, he will show you some things. And when, when, when God shows you some things, look at what he says. He said, I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. It's prayer time. When we pray, now, God is still talking to these same folk that worship idol gods. He's talking to the same folk that, that poured out offerings to idol gods. He's talking to the same folk that bowed down to Baal. It says to us that God is long-suffering and he's compassionate. He says to them, even though you've done these things, call to me. Pray to me. Have everyday conversations with me. And when you call to me, I will answer you. I will answer you. He says, call to me as the Lord. And, and when you call to me, I will point out this time, I will point out some things that you need to know. He says, I will answer you. And this word call means to cry out to God. It means to call on God like it's all dependent on him. Have you ever called somebody? And when you call them, you know that was the last call you can make. Have you ever wanted some money? Did you call a broke person? Did you call a person that's always asking you for money? If you wanted money, you called on somebody who you knew had. God says, I have it. I got it for you. I want to give it to you. But you need to call on me. And when you call on me, I'm going to answer you. And when I answer you, I'm going to point out some things. First of all, I'm going to show you great and mighty things. Great and mighty things. These things are not accessible any other way. You can't get it with your finances. That's right. We think physically many times. We think that if we call on God and he, we want something, he ought to give it to us right now. And that's how some of us pray. God, I need you right now. God, touch right now. God, and we ought to pray that God bless us right away. But the fact of the matter is, in this text, he's talking about abstract things non-tangible things. He's talking about stuff like love, peace, joy. He's talking about abstract things that you cannot ex access on your own. You know, if you, if you got money, you can buy food. But you can't buy peace. If you, if you have money, you can buy a bed, but you can't buy rest. If you have money, you can buy a house, but you can't buy a home. These are things that you cannot 
access on your own. The other thing is the word the word is unfathomable. Things that you can't even imagine. Things that you can't even see. Things that you didn't even think God could put you in that position. Have you ever gone somewhere and you look around and say, how did I get here? It must have been the blessings of the Lord. These are unfathomable things. God has done great things to us. God has done great things for us. God has put us in a position that we never thought we could. A lot of people got jobs that they didn't have the right criteria for. Your resume could not get you that job, but God put you there. And then God kept you there because he's God. So when you pray, you ought to pray and ask God for things that are not tangible, things that are not accessible, things that are unfathomable, things that are so great of a work that no one can do it but God. And in the meantime, we ought to work for God as if it's all depending on us. We pray to God as if it's all depending on God, and it is. And we ought to work for God as if it's all depending on us. Work as if it's all depending on you, and pray as if it's all depending on God. And God can work on your behalf. What are some intangible things that you want God to do? I mean, some, something that your new job can't get you. Something that your, your homeowner association can't do. God, I just, I, just want, I just want peace. God, I just want to love. God, I just want to be loved. God, I just want more of you. Teach me how to address others. Teach me how to express love. I want more of what God has for me. Usually when we say we want more of what God has, we're talking about stuff. We want God, give me that stuff. Give me that stuff. But we seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, all this other stuff will be added. Don't seek the stuff. Seek Seek the God, get a right relationship with him, a right fellowship with him, walk with God, stay with God, and when you walk with God and stay with God, God already knows what you want. And he certainly knows what you need. He says, call to me, I will answer, and I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. And these great and mighty things, whether they're tangible or untangible, God says, I got some stuff that you don't even dream about. You haven't even thought about. You can't even think about. God got some things for us that are out of this world. You know, we like to, we like to, sit, we like to quote this scripture. I have not seen, ear has not heard, what great things that God has in store for those who love him. We haven't even seen the half yet. That's why when John writes in Revelation, he just said, I saw a number, 144,000. He could count that number then. He said, oh, heck, I see a number that no man can number. In other words, John gets happy and he was like, wow, this is something that I've never seen before. But that's what God and so he's prepared us through Jesus Christ to receive our blessings, to receive comfort, receive peace, receive joy. Because when you get that thing, whatever that stuff is, it's no guarantee to be satisfied to you. get a car, and you thought that car was going to fix all your problems, guess what, that car got problems. You get a house, and you thought, you thought that house was going to fix all your needs, and then plumbing breaks down, electricity has problems. So when you have peace in the middle of a storm, that's what you need. And only God can do it. He made, made sure that he could do it with Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago. 
Jesus died for our sins. He was spirit and he rose again. And that same Jesus is the only one who can give us peace and joy. Mm -hmm. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. If you want peace, if you want joy, if you want to be able to access, access the inaccessible, you need Jesus. Will you come to Jesus right now and trust him on behalf of what he's already done? And we ought to thank God for who he is, thank him for what he's done, thank him for what he's going to do, and thank him for what he's doing right now. If you never received Jesus as your personal Savior, you don't have that peace, you don't have that joy. You don't have that inaccessible ability. But if you trust Jesus, you will. You bow your head with me and invite him into your life. Not only will you have access to him on earth, but you will have eternal life in heaven. Just bow your head and repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank God. We believe if you love to pray this prayer, trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we believe that you're born again, you're saved, and, and you're going to heaven when you die. Today, this month, every Wednesday, we're in prayer. I'm going to ask you to join us in prayer. Even as we sign off tonight, spend some time with the Lord in prayer, asking God to bless us, thanking Him for what He's already done, trusting Him for what He's going to do. Please remember that we're looking forward to seeing what God is going to do that the Bible says is great and mighty, that things that we don't know. Thank you again for joining us. Please join us on Sunday at 9 a.m. for our Sunday school. Join us at 10.30 a.m. for our worship service. And continue to join us on Wednesday night at 7.15 p.m. every Wednesday for prayer and Bible study. If you want to give by way of Zell, you can give your offering or your gift to lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our cell account. Or you can mail in your gifts to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our worship service. Be blessed.